Mr. President, uh, my chairman on the Finance Committee, uh, Chairman Grassley, who just left the floor, called me a scholar, and I think he meant it as a compliment, but it doesn't feel like that today. It actually feels like the fact that I've been reading this this afternoon is a sign of uh, the fact that this institution is broken in significant ways, and there are not a lot of productive things happening outside a group of four people who are renegotiating a car deal again and again and again and again. So I did spend a good chunk of my afternoon reading these 1,119 pages. You might wonder what this is. This is uh, Nancy Pelosi's last minute additional Christmas wish list of progressive uh, items that she wants added to the coronavirus relief bill that's been being negotiated here over the course of the last 96 or so hours. I wanted to read this because I think we owe it to our constituents to know what are, what's in bills before people pass them. And I want to say in full disclosure, the wish list keeps growing so rapidly and radically that this thing could be like 50% obsolete since three or four hours ago when I started digging into it. There may be another bill that's another 1,200 pages thick. But this is the one I've been reading in today. And the speaker has obviously decided that she doesn't want to waste any crisis the American people face two unprecedented emergencies. We face a public health emergency that is genuinely disastrous, and we face a consequent resultant economic emergency that puts at risk lots and lots of families' livelihoods, lots of dinner tables around the country. There are 5,997,000 firms in the U.S., so just a hair shy of uh, 6 million, I think I might have misspoke there, 5,997,000 firms. So just, just shy of 6 million firms in the U.S. And lots and lots and lots of those, the overwhelming majority of firms and 47% of all employment is small business in America. It's firms of 500 or fewer employees. These are family businesses. These are corner stores. Lots and lots and lots of these people live on an average, their businesses live on an average of 16 days of cash. And so when the country is shut down in the midst of something like the coronavirus crisis, there are lots of businesses that only have about two weeks before they may cease to exist and just go poof or do something, go down some other pathway that leads them to become dependencies of the state. So we have two massive crises in this country, one public health and one economic. And this place often lies and pretends there's some piece of legislation that can solve every problem on earth. That isn't true. But in this case, both of these emergencies need lots and lots of help and bandage and salve and, and lifelines, life preservers from this institution. And that's why so many people around here have been working all night, overnight, three or four days in a row. A number of us, of us have been in this chamber um, till midnight or 1 a.m. multiple nights. I'm a 4 a.m. wake up guy, so I'm usually in bed by 9 p.m. Uh, when I'm here at midnight or 1 a.m., uh, it's well past a period of coherence. And so, when, when we're working around the clock, it's because there's an emergency. Lots and lots and lots of stuff in this 1,119-page additional bid from Nancy Pelosi have nothing to do with the coronavirus emergency. And so I want to take us through some of what is in this piece of legislation. This negotiation has been messy. There's lots and lots in this bill that I don't like. There's lots in this bill that all, is also critically important and necessary and urgent for the American people. But there are a bunch of things in here that I think stink, frankly. I don't like firm-specific money in legislation, so I don't like much of the airlines section of this bill. The airlines didn't do anything wrong at this moment when all their travelers fall off because of the, the pandemic before them. But there are pieces of the way any legislation like this is written when it has specific firms in it. Uh, that I dislike and I think should be done more effectively over time, but this is following a model of how these, kind, these portions of legislation have been written around here in the past. I don't like the direct payments that Washington is going to try to renew long after the American people have defeated the coronavirus. There's a lot in this legislation that I don't like, but there are things that we should all be applauding. This legislation tries to turbocharge vaccine development, we need what my friend and your friend, uh, the senator from Montana, calls a Manhattan project.
for the vaccine accelerator. We need to go lots faster figuring out how to remove barriers to enable companies at this time to seek to be effective over efficient in ways that pluralize lots and lots of different pharmaceutical firms competing at once and taking three or four steps of the drug development or the vaccine development process and trying to run them in parallel instead of in sequence because the American people and the world need this vaccine. There are things that we should be proud of in that part of the legislation. I like the fact that the, this legislation, not the Pelosi legislation, but the, the composite uh, compromise bill that the Senate's been working on over the last four days. I like the fact that this legislation tries to help small businesses stay alive during this period of zero revenue with well-structured loans. I think that Senators Rubio and colleague, uh, Collins and their two Democratic colleagues on the other side of the aisle have done a really good job. It's a crazy eye-popping price tag at $350 billion-ish, the small business load program, but it's a necessity in this moment, and it's legislation that people should be proud of. I like the fact that this bill works in the appropriations section, not in the whole bill, as I would, or the whole uh, draft text as I wish it would, but in the appropriations section, it works hard to get more than 51% of the appropriation section of the money to governors to allow them to make differentiated spending decisions which they can make more effectively than we can make in Washington, D.C., where you look out across 325 million people in an undifferentiated way. Our governors are better at building public-private public -private partnerships than the Congress is. In my state, Omaha and Lincoln have different economics than the rural parts of the state, but Omaha and Lincoln are different than Nashville and Memphis. And Nashville and Memphis are different than, than LA and Seattle. And so this bill works hard to try to take a big chunk, a majority of the appropriation section of the, the legislation and drive it back to governors. There are things that are good in this bill. There are things that I think are weak and clunky in this bill but it was negotiated in a bipartisan way, in good faith, on topics and issues that were related to the coronavirus emergency. It wasn't a Republican bill, it wasn't a Democratic bill, it certainly isn't my favorite bill or piece of legislation around here, but it was a good faith bipartisan attempt that people were negotiating on all weekend. But instead of taking that legislation urgent, necessary legislation, and passing it quickly, Democrats have now decided to allow Speaker Pelosi to block it through proxies here in the Senate so that she can rewrite the bill with a ton of crap that has absolutely nothing to do with the public health emergency that we face at this moment. So I've been reading the legislation the af this afternoon. We got families that are suffering. We got small businesses that are closing literally by the hour. We have doctors fighting to prevent their hospitals from being oversurged and overwhelmed. And what is Speaker Pelosi trying to do? She's trying to take hostages about her dream legislation, all sorts of dream legislative provisions that have nothing to do with this moment, and say, the American public can't get access to the public health piece of legislation or the economic relief pieces of legislation unless she gets hostages that are entirely unrelated to this moment. We're better than that. Democrats in the Senate are better than that. Many of them are privately embarrassed about this. I don't understand how they voted today to filibuster this bill for a second time when in private many of them tell us, well, this is just a part of the negotiation and our leaders want us to vote this way, but I'm really uncomfortable with it because I don't think we should be dealing with unrelated issues. I've had multiple Democrats today tell me they don't think we should be dealing with unrelated issues, things not about the health or economic emergency before the nation. But here's why we've stopped. Here's why the bill that's before us, again, not my favorite piece of legislation, not Republican, not Democrat, but a bipartisan, good faith piece of legislation, the reason we're not voting on it is because 1,119 pages of new Nancy Pelosi demands that we, we should consider. I promise you that every Washington, D.C. lobbyist right now has been combing over this 1,200 pages all afternoon, just like I have, because they wonder what goodies in it they can claim credit for, or they wonder what goodies they should, that are against the interests of their sector they should be negotiating against. We shouldn't be debating anything in an emergency moment like this with another 1,119 pages being dropped in at the last minute of wish list demand. So I decided to start digging through it. Let me give you a few highlights or lowlights. Here's page 421. <clears throat> 
Page 421, line 22. Minimum student loan relief as a result of the COVID-19 national emergency. Not later than 270 days after the last day of the COVID emergency period. Think about what this means. Not later than 270 days. That's nine months. Nine months after the emergency is over, then the Secretary of Education has to do all this new stuff. Nobody who wants student loan, debt loan forgiveness should pretend that this is about getting emergency cash into the economy for liquidity or solvency because the Nancy Pelosi demand about loan forgiveness says right here, this is for something nine months after the emergency. This is something that many Democrats want. As a former college president, I actually think this is a bad idea, but there are intellectually defensible reasons to argue for it. There are reasonable cases to be made, but they've tried to make them in the past and not been able to pass the legislation, and it has nothing, nothing to do with the coronavirus. Not later than 270 days after the last day of the COVID-19 emergency period, the Secretary's concern shall jointly carry out a program under which a qualified borrower with respect to the covered loans and private education of loans of such qualified borrower shall receive in accordance with paragraph 3 an amount equal to the lesser of the following, A, the total amount of each loan covered and each private education loan of the borrower, or B, $10,000. So what this says is you can feel the burn with a $10,000 public and private loan cancellation project a year in the future, or depending on how long this emergency goes, this emergency could be with us through a, a trough in the late summer and another peak in the fall and winter. We may be in the coronavirus emergency for more than a year. And so Speaker Pelosi says, well, the secretaries, the, the cabinet officials in the executive branch probably shouldn't be burdened with this then, now, because obviously it has nothing to do with coronavirus. But in the future, we want to bake into law a $10,000 loan forgiveness program that has nothing to do with coronavirus. That's wrong. This institution has been bleeding public trust for a long time. When we pass a $2 trillion piece of legislation in the middle of an emergency, there are going to be lots of things wrong with it. There are going to be lots of reasons why the public looks back and says, why aren't you all more competent? Why couldn't you have done this better? Why wouldn't you have done that better? Boy, this feels clunky. Why would these people be included in the direct payments, but those people wouldn't? You have to earn $2,500, but we're using the 2018 tax returns to be able to determine whether or not you earned your $2,500 to be able to qualify for the $1,200 per family, and it phases out from seventy-five dollars to $95,000. There are a lot of hard policy, uh, mechanical, technical issues that need to be navigated, and some of them will be imperfect, and later the public will say, well, why did you do it this way instead of this way? Those will be fair questions. And, and we'll have to defend the members of the task forces who wrote that part of the legislation, a bipartisan task force that worked on that piece of the legislation all weekend. But what will be completely impossible is to tell the public, well, the reason we did the loan forgiveness program, which had nothing to do with coronavirus this way rather than that way, was because why? Because it was a northbound train and people could load it with a whole bunch of swampy stuff. Like, you may believe in loan forgiveness. Make the case and win an argument for loan forgiveness. Don't do it on the backs of a national emergency when in Nebraska I have families calling me from Omaha where spouses have just been put in new institutions in the last two or three weeks because of declining dementia, because of Alzheimer's, and as soon as they got put in an institution, that institution got put on quarantine lockdown, and a husband only in his late 60s, but who's losing his entire mind and memory, he doesn't understand why he's there, and his, his wife can't visit him anymore. His kids can't visit him anymore, and he doesn't know what the heck's going on. That's a genuine tragedy. That's not an occasion for Nancy Pelosi to try to get a loan forgiveness program done that she couldn't get done by regular legislation. It's wrong. And the Democrats in this body, most of them know it's wrong. None of them are going to come down here and make an argument. None of 47 Democrats in the Senate are going to come to the floor and say, you know what we ought to do during this national emergency? We ought to do a student loan forgiveness program right now. Somebody might mention it in a long list, implying that the money will have to do with liquidity. But if you actually read what happens in the legislation, there's no loan forgiveness until 270 days after the coronavirus national emergency is over. Page 270. Uh, sorry, 570. Not even coronavirus can put a pause on our culture wars. 
Line 14, the Congressional COVID-19 Aid Oversight Panel in conjunction with SIGTARP, I don't know what that acronym means, shall collect diversity data from any corporation that receives federal aid related to COVID-19 and issue a report that will make publicly available no later than one year after the disbursement of funds. In addition to any other data, the report will include all the following. Number one, employee demographics. The gender, race, and ethnic identity, and to the extent possible, results disaggregated by ethnic group of all corporation employees, as otherwise known or provided voluntarily for the total number of employees, full and part-time, dot, dot, dot. I'm just going to skip ahead a couple of paragraphs. And pay equity, a comparison of pay amongst racial and ethnic minorities, and to the extent possible, results disaggregated by ethnic group as compared to their white counterparts, and a comparison of pay between men and women for sub similar roles and assignments. Paragraph four, corporate board diversity, corporate board diversity data, including total number of board members, race, gender, class, ethnic identity, et cetera, et cetera. I'm skipping ahead here. Uh, page 572, which is the next page. Uh, paragraph E, any corporation that receives federal aid related to COVID-19 must now maintain officials and budgets dedicated to diversity inclusion initiatives for no less than five years after blah, blah, blah. None of this has anything to do with the coronavirus. There are all sorts of real racial issues in America that need to be addressed, but none of this has anything to do with the coronavirus. If you want to argue for this legislation, argue for this legislation. Once people in nursing homes in Nebraska aren't being locked out of being able to visit their, their family members with Alzheimer's and dementia. Page 681. Line 16, section 325, same day registration. In general, each state shall permit any eligible individual on a day of the federal election or on any day when voting, including early voting, is permitted for a federal election to register to vote in such election at the same polling place using a form that meets the requirements under section 9B of the National Ro Voter Registration Act of 1993, or if the individual is already registered to vote to revise any of the individual's registration information and B, to cast such a vote in an election, paragraph two, exception the requirements under paragraph one shall not apply to a state in which, under a state law in effect, continuously on or after the date of enactment of this section. You see, what this is about is this about same day voter registration because November 3rd is just 225 days away. And if there's anything the American people are worried right now about, it's that they would like Washington, D.C. to take away the authority of 50 secretaries of state and determine the way you conduct local elections in America. This has absolutely nothing to do with coronavirus. Absolutely nothing to do with coronavirus. This isn't a Republican versus Democratic scream, this is nonsense. This is 99% of the American public, if they were in this gallery, would be shaking their head and rolling their eyes and saying, what? You guys are trying to decide that the federal government should, for the first time in U.S. history, change the way local elections are conducted by secretaries of state in America? By the way, there's no one in the gallery for a reason. The gallery is shut down because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So this probably isn't the time to be having a debate about whether the federal government should micromanage the way our 50 states conduct their elections. I think this is a bad idea, but if you want to argue for this idea, let's do it as soon as the pandemic is over. Come and actually make an argument. Quit trying to exploit a crisis. Page 725. There's almost no section of American life or government that can't be touched in an emergency if you want to play, if you want to play exploitative politics. Line 12, Division N, UN Post, U.S. Postal Service provisions, because of course in the middle of a pandemic, you know what the American people want? They want to have a labor fight about the Postal Service. Section 140001, elimination of the USPS debt, additional borrowing authorities. In general, notwithstanding any other provision of the law, paragraph one, any outstanding debt of the United States Postal Service owed to the Treasury pursuant to sections 2005 and 2011 of Title V United States Code on the date of the enactment of this act is hereby canceled and paragraph two, after the date of the enactment of this act, the U.S. Postal Service is authorized to borrow money from the Treasury in an amount not to exceed, I gotta count all these uh, numbers, 
$15 billion to carry out the duties and responsibilities of the Postal Service, including those under Title 39 of the U.S. Code, and the Secretary of the Treasury shall lend to such amount at the request of the Postal Service. Paragraph B, repeal of the fiscal year borrowing limit of Section 2005A1 of Title 39. The United States Code is now ab amended by shrinking the paragraph, quote, in any one fiscal year, close quote, and all that follows that period. Please, Senate Democrats, you don't believe that this is good governance. Somebody please come to the floor and defend why we're doing a postal service bailout in the middle of an emergency. I know that Bernie Sanders believes in postal service reform. I don't agree with Senator Sanders on this, but he's actually pretty thoughtful about it. He spent a lot of time thinking about how you might bail out the postal service. So if Bernie Sanders wants to argue for a postal service bailout, he should make that case. There's not a single, I haven't been here all day, but I've presided a couple hours. I haven't heard a single Democrat come to the floor and argue for a postal service bailout. Somebody please come back to the floor and, and at least stand in the light of day before the American people and say the stuff Nancy Pelosi's voting for you think is a good idea to do in the middle of this national health emergency. Page 768. <clears throat> Line 7. In general, notwithstanding any other provision of law subject to the requirements of this subsection, the wage rate in effect under Section A1 with respect to to an employer, employee of an employer described in paragraph two, or any individual who provides labor or services for remuneration for such employer, regardless of whether the individual is classified as an independent contractor or otherwise by employer, comma, shall not be paid less than $15 an hour. So while businesses are struggling to make ends meet, and we're seeing lots and lots of small businesses go bankrupt in all 50 states in America today, Businesses are going bankrupt in America today in all 50 of the states that we represent. Speaker Pelosi wants to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I, I used to be a professor. I'm a business guy by background, but I was a history professor for a long time. And when I would teach, I taught in the Socratic method when I taught in a seminar. In a lecture class, it's different. But in a seminar, if I had 12 students or I had 15 students in a class, I would regularly try to frame up a given weekly seminar. And I would try to figure out how to map a debate where you could get about half the people in the class on each side of a debate. But if it ended up that the, the debate was off-weighted, and there was a minority group and a majority group, I would tend to join the minority group, regardless of what my view was on the issue. And I would try to fight for the minority position just to help spice up the debate and make it more interesting. I think a $15 minimum wage is really bad economics, but I've argued for it many, many times in class because there are intellectually coherent reasons to argue for it. I don't think it works. And if we weren't dealing with the pandemic in King County, Washington, one of the things we might talk about in this body is how the $15 minimum wage has worked out in Seattle because their public was overwhelmingly in favor of it a couple of years ago. And now there's a huge move against it because people realize what a $15 minimum wage actually does. It accelerates the marginalization and the casualization and the layoffs of people making between $9 and $14 an hour. That's what it actually does. It speeds automation. So I would love it if anybody who was a primary breadwinner in a house was earning way more than $15 an hour. I would love that, that to be reality in American life. But here are two facts you need to know. Fact number one, 80, last time I checked the data, 89% uh, of everybody who made the minimum wage in America wasn't a primary wage earner. They were a high school kid. <clears throat> They were a college student getting their first job. They were working part-time while they were in school or they just graduated high school and they hadn't figured out their long-term path. Maybe they were in trade school, but they were working a minimum wage job, but they still lived at mom and dad's house. Or maybe they're a 65-year-old aunt who lives with a family, but the, the rest of the house is self-sufficient, but her wages augment the family's uh, income. 89% of the people who make the minimum wage in America are not the primary wage earner or breadwinner uh, in their family. But of the 11% that are, the idea that you can just raise the minimum wage to any amount, I mean, if, if you just think good intentions are sufficient, then why $15? For heaven's sakes, $15 an hour on a $2,000 work year, 40 hours a week times 50 weeks, that's only $30,000 a year. It's really hard to get by on $30 a year or $30,000 a year. If you think good intentions are enough, $15 isn't enough. Why not have a minimum wage of $25? Why not $30 an hour? 
Well, the reason is because it doesn't actually work. If you just raise the minimum wage to a different level than the marginal contribution value of that job, what happens is the firms either cease to exist or people automate more rapidly. But there are reasonable arguments to be made. Certainly there are emotional and humanitarian arguments to be made for wanting a $15 minimum wage. But wanting a $15 minimum wage is an argument you should make. It's not something you do in the midst of a public health emergency. And it's certainly not something you do in the midst of a public health emergency where lots and lots of small businesses are ceasing to exist. Because a $15 minimum wage will just drive more people out of business. And so it it's, would be better to have a $15 an hour job than an $11 an hour job, but it'd be better to have an $11 an hour job than no job. And so if you're going to debate a $15 minimum wage, please do it in the light of day. What Speaker Pelosi's doing here is wrong. Page 803. <clears throat> this one goes on for a bunch of pages, so I'll, I'll jump across. Um, line 10, section 704, airline carbon emission offsets and goals, carbon offsetting program. In general, not later than 90 days after the enactment of this act, the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration shall require each air carrier receiving assistance under section 101 to fully offset the annual carbon emissions of such air carriers for domestic flights beginning in the year 2025. The administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration shall require each air carrier receiving assistance under Section 101-2A make and achieve a binding commitment to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions attributable to the domestic flights of such air carrier in every calendar year beginning in 2021 on a path consistent with a 25% reduction in the aviation sector's emission levels from sections from 2005 levels by the year 2035. And a 50% reduction in the section's emissions from 2005 to apply by the year 2050. This is like something out of the Green New Deal for the age of COVID, but it's just the technocratic piece for airline emissions. And here we're dealing with the part about airline emissions from the year 2035 to the year 2050. If you've been looking at the data this afternoon, one of the things that Scott Gottlieb has been talking about a lot today is we see that the hospitalization rates and the case fatality rate for the 45 to 54 year old hospital admissions COVID-19 patients in the US look a lot worse than we thought they were a week ago. There are some things on the Italy curve that are scary and ugly. There are some pieces of it where we might think there are little bits of hopeful signs that as we have a lot more uh, positive tests, but we know we simultaneously have community transmission problems, but we also have a lot more testing. If you get more positive tests, some of that's because you have more positive confirmation of disease, but some of it's just because you're doing more testing. There's some things that might be mildly good news, but Gottlieb has been talking today, a former FDA commissioner, has been talking about some really bad news, which is we talk about this disease as being particularly bad for people over 60, but there's been a lot of hopeful signs, besides our love of neighbor obligations not to be transmitting the disease to our grandmas and, and to our parents and to the elderly among us. But it looks like among 45 to 54 year olds, um, if the death rate does look to be, we don't know, but on, on some preliminary data, looks to be between five tenths and seven tenths of a percent compared to flu at one tenth of a percent across the whole population, that would be a stunningly high case death rate among the 45 to 54 year olds. You know what none of those people care about right now? Maybe they care about it, but they don't think that we should be legislating on without any long debate. None of them are talking about airline emissions between the year 2035 and 2050. Nancy Pelosi shouldn't be talking about it either. Page 911. I'll stop soon. I see one of my colleagues waiting to talk. Page 911. <clears throat> Line three, section 404, modification of the special rules for minimum funding standards for community newspapers. You wonder what's gonna stop the public health crisis? We should talk about the, the business model of local newspapers right now, rather than getting the American people the health and uh, the, the relief they need. 
Uh, paragraph A, amendment to the Internal Revenue Code of 1986, subsection M of section 430 of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986, as added by the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act of 2019, is amended hereby to read as follows. Special rules for community newspaper plans. In general, an eligible newspaper plan sponsor of a plan which under which no participant has had the participant's accrued benefit increased, whether because of service or compensation after April 2nd of 2019, may elect to have the alternative standards described in paragraph four applied to the plan. Eligible newspaper plan sponsor, the term eligible newspaper plan, plan sponsor here means, and then there are like four or five different definitions of what an eligible newspaper plan sponsor would mean. If the American people wonder why Congress hasn't passed a coronavirus emergency health and emergency economics relief plan, I think it would be great if Speaker Pelosi went out and stood at a gaggle before the cameras and started talking about the newspaper sponsor alternative plan definition provisions of her bid in this negotiation on page 911, subsection B. One more uh, for now. Uh, on page 931, Rehabilitation of multi-employer pension plans, line 16, paragraph A, establishment. There is established in the Department of Treasury an agency to be known as the Pension Rehabilitation Administration. By the way, there is no such thing. This doesn't exist. It's being created of whole cloth here. So in the middle of a national health pandemic emergency, we're creating new bureaucracies to deal with insolvent pensions. There is established hereby uh, a position and position of director. There shall be a head of the Pension Rehabilitation Admin Administration as a director who shall be appointed by the president to a term in general. A term of director shall last five years. I'm going to stop. This is wrong. This ought not to be happening. It's not being done in good faith. Basically, none of this stuff is really going to be considered in any negotiation. It's a guise and a ruse to try to move the goalposts. Once people played nine innings of a baseball game in a negotiation and somebody decided to use a whole bunch of their pitchers, um, then the decision was made, hey, let's add five more innings to the baseball game. The American people are waiting for this relief act, and it's gone on for another 36 hours here for no reason that's honorable and sincere. There are a whole bunch of big and real debates that could be had inside the four corners of the four kind of five task forces that helped write this piece of legislation. There are lots of reasonable debates to be had inside that. Throwing in a laundry list of Christmas, Christmas list fighting is why this place bleeds public trust. The Democratic whip in the House said it explicitly, quote, a tremendous opportunity exists exists in this crisis, I'm adding in brackets, to restructure things here to fit our vision, close quote. None of these things, none of these 1,119 pages are about solving the crisis. None of the nine paragraphs that I decided to read beat the, the virus. None of these things keep small business alive. I get it. Spence, Speaker Pelosi is a liberal progressive from San Francisco. I'm a conservative from Nebraska. We have a different political philosophy. That is fine. It is completely reasonable for us to debate politics and policy uh, and ideology when we're not in the middle of a crisis. Speaker Pelosi could bring her liberal wish list to the House floor for a vote anytime she wants. Unlike most of us, she controls an agenda. But she ought to have the decency to vote on her ideologically driven wish list after this emergency legislation has been passed. We're better than this, and this is not the way to restore the public trust. We should do better.